Are you curious about the tragic events faced by Richard Boone, who plays Paladin in Have Gun, Will Travel? Best known for more than 50 outstanding Western films, Richard Boone has become a giant in the American entertainment industry with outstanding critical acclaim. However, behind those roles, Richard Boone had to silently cope with the tragedies of life. To know what the hell happened to Richard. Then don't miss this video. Richard Allen Boone initially harbored aspirations of becoming a painter in Los Angeles. His artistic journey led him through esteemed institutions, including Stanford University, the Los Angeles Art Students League, and the Chouinard Art Institute in California. Boone's departure from Stanford was marked by a peculiar incident, chronicled in the Valley Times of North Hollywood in 1951. Evidently, he and his fraternity brothers concocted a mischievous plan involving a dummy. In a prank that would unfold unexpectedly, they orchestrated a fake emergency, luring a friend from another fraternity to rush to their eyed. The ruse involved a strategically placed dummy in the shrubbery lining the street, a block or so away from their house. As fate would have it, when the unsuspecting driver approached steering a car similar to their friends, the dummy was pushed into the street and met its unfortunate demise under the wheels. To the utter shock of Boone and his cohorts, the driver turned out to be none other than Mrs. Herbert Hoover. The gravity of the situation escalated when Mrs. Hoover, horrified at the prospect of having unintentionally caused harm, leaped out of her car, only to fall and sprain her ankle. The aftermath of this ill-fated prank involved a thorough investigation by university authorities. Their verdict suggested that the masterminds behind the elaborate joke were squandering their talents for showmanship as students of Stanford. This incident not only highlighted Boone's inclination towards theatricality, but also hinted at the mischievous and rebellious spirit that would later find an outlet in his diverse career, where he eventually gained renown as an accomplished actor. Following his artistic pursuits and time spent in an artist's colony, Richard Allen Boone's life took a significant turn with the advent of the United States' involvement in World War II. In response to the global conflict, he enlisted in the Navy, dedicating four years of his life as a gunner stationed in the South Pacific. Boone's wartime experiences were far removed from the tranquil world of art, as he humorously noted in 1970. You can't carry an easel on a torpedo plane, so I wrote. During his military service, Boone found solace and expression in writing, crafting short stories heavily influenced by literary giants such as Hemingway and Dos Passos. However, he recognized a weakness in his dialogue writing skills. Determined to refine his craft, Boone made a pivotal decision after the war ended. Utilizing the GI Bill, he enrolled in the Neighborhood Playhouse in New York, driven by a desire to learn the art of writing and, in particular, to master the nuances of dialogue. Initially, Booney's intention was to immerse himself in the world of actors, observing firsthand how dialogue was effectively conveyed on the stage. However, his trajectory took an unexpected turn as he discovered an innate talent for acting during his time at the Neighborhood Playhouse. During his time at the Neighborhood Playhouse, Richard Allen Boone immersed himself in a rich and diverse educational experience, studying under the tutelage of renowned figures in the performing arts. Sanford Meisner, a prominent acting teacher and co-founder of the Neighborhood Playhouse, played a crucial role in shaping Boone's understanding of the craft. Meisner's innovative techniques in method acting, focusing on emotional authenticity and responsiveness, left an indelible mark on Boone's approach to the art of acting. Furthermore, Boone had the privilege of studying under Martha Graham, a pioneering figure in modern dance. This exposure to dance not only broadened his artistic horizons, but also contributed to his holistic understanding of performance. Boone's commitment to his craft was evident when, in the 1970s, he returned to the neighborhood playhouse to serve as a director teacher passing on his accumulated knowledge to the next generation of aspiring actors. 
Boone's journey into the world of method acting continued as he became one of the early members of Lee Strasberg's Actors Studio. This affiliation provided him with invaluable opportunities to collaborate closely with luminaries such as Lee Strasberg himself and acclaimed director Elia Kazan. The Actors Studio, known for its emphasis on the Stanislavski method and the exploration of emotional depth in acting, further honed Boone's skills and contributed to his growth as a versatile performer. In addition to his work with Strasberg and Kazan, Boone expanded his artistic repertoire by studying and dancing with Martha Graham, Anna Sokolow, and Nina Fonaroff. This exposure to various forms of expression, including dance, added layers to Boone's artistic sensibilities, influencing his approach to movement and physicality on the stage. Boone's Broadway debut in 1948 marked a significant milestone in his career. He graced the stage in the production of Medea, sharing it with distinguished actors Judith Anderson and John Gielgud. The play, which ran for an impressive 214 performances, showcased Boone's ability to captivate audiences in a dramatic setting. As Richard Boone reflected on the early days of Have Gun, Will Travel, a television series that would become a classic, he provided insights into the transformative experience of embodying the character Paladin. In a 1958 piece for the Wellsville Daily Reporter, Boone recollected a moment in a Madison Avenue screening room where CBS and advertising executives were viewing the pilot episode. The observation that stood out was a testament to Boone's ability to transcend his previous television persona. Someone in the darkness remarked, Say, that damn doctor can really ride a horse. Up until then, Boone was predominantly known for his role as Dr. Steiner on Medic. For Boone, the shift from playing a doctor to becoming Paladin represented a welcomed change of pace. He expressed the actor's perpetual quest for roles that provide substance and challenge, stating that the meatier the role, the better the actor's feast. After being with Paladin for over a year, Boone conveyed a sense of comfort and joy, stating, I feel right at home with him in the show. I've never had so much fun. In a 1957 interview with the Petaluma Argus Courier, Boone delved further into the character of Paladin and the unique appeal of Have Gun, Will Travel. When he adorned the iconic Paladin outfit, he described feeling sensational. The character, set in an era of class and elegance, resonated with Boone, who admired the sophistication of the bygone days. Paladin, he emphasized, was not just a man in a distinctive costume. He was a great character with a keen sense of humor and a penchant for quoting things. Boone highlighted the deliberate effort to create Paladin as an elegantly deadly character, setting him apart from the conventional Western series. Paladin's professionalism and efficiency were emphasized. He didn't need to empty his gun trying to hit someone. One bullet sufficed for the job. This intentional departure from Western cliches added depth to the character and made Have Gun, Will Travel a standout series in the genre. In Boone's words, Paladin was quite a character, embodying a unique blend of wit, style, and lethal prowess that captivated audiences and contributed to the enduring legacy of the show. Have Gun, Will Travel, spanning from 1957 to 1963, carved its niche in television history, distinguished not only by its longevity, but also by the quality of its scripts. The show garnered acclaim for its more literary approach, setting it apart from many other contemporary Western series. Created by Sam Rolfe, who later went on to create The Man from UNKLE, the series boasted teleplays written by a notable roster of writers, including the legendary Gene Roddenberry, the future creator of Star Trek. Gene Roddenberry's contributions to Have Gun, Will Travel were substantial, as he penned 24 scripts throughout the series' run. This fact alone is a testament to Roddenberry's versatility as a writer, showcasing his ability to navigate different genres, from westerns to the futuristic realm of science fiction. 
His involvement added a layer of depth and intellectual sophistication to the series, elevating it beyond the typical conventions of Western television. In an exclusive excerpt from The 50-Year Mission, Doug Drexler, a television scenic artist and a fan of both Have Gun, Will Travel and Star Trek, highlighted two scripts penned by Roddenberry as among his favorites. According to Drexler, these scripts served as perfect examples of what distinguished Have Gun, Will Travel from most other Westerns. Doug Drexler, a devoted fan of both Have Gun, Will Travel and Star Trek, delves into the uniqueness and brilliance of Gene Roddenberry's script writing with a particular focus on the episode titled The Great Mojave Chase. In this memorable installment, Roddenberry weaves a tale that encapsulates the distinctiveness that sets Have Gun, Will Travel apart from conventional westerns. The episode unfolds with Paladin, the sophisticated and resourceful protagonist, leisurely reading a newspaper in a hotel alongside a cavalry colonel who is inebriated and exasperated after a challenging assignment. The colonel bemoans the army's decision to experiment with camels as a replacement for horses, emphasizing their foul odor and disagreeable attitudes. This detail, rooted in historical accuracy, adds a layer of authenticity to the narrative. Roddenberry, known for his ingenuity, sees the opportunity to infuse a creative twist into the storyline. Doug Drexler elucidates the pivotal moment when Paladin, engrossed in the newspaper, comes across a report on the Great Mojave Chase. This sparks an idea in Paladin's mind. He decides to enter the race, not with a horse, but with a camel. The revelation occurs in tandem with the colonel's disparaging remarks about camels, creating a comedic and unexpected turn of events. The humor and novelty of the situation are heightened when, just as Paladin is contemplating his unconventional plan, the colonel dismissively asks, Who the hell would want one of those stinking things anyway? To which Paladin wittily replies, I don't know. Could be your best friend. This exchange not only injects humor into the scene, but also sets the stage for the unexpected twist that follows. Daug Drexler highlights another gim from Havigun, Will Travel, Titlid Magie Obanion, showcasing the versatility and depth of Gene Roddenberry's scriptwriting. This episode unfolds as Paladin faces an unexpected twist of fate when he is robbed and left without his clothes and trusty horse. Desperation leads him to a farmhouse where a woman resides. She agrees to assist him, but, in exchange, demands that he take on domestic chores such as cooking and cleaning. The narrative takes an intriguing turn as the woman, played by Lisa Gay, begins to develop feelings for Paladin. Doug Drexler describes how Paladin's culinary skills become the catalyst for this blossoming connection. Paladin's ability to create remarkable dishes captivates the woman, leading to an unconventional but heartwarming love story. A pivotal moment in the episode occurs when the woman, displaying her intelligence, notices a callus on Paladin's thumb. She takes his gun hand and queries, How did you get a callus like this? This seemingly innocuous detail becomes a key plot point, adding an element of mystery and curiosity to the unfolding relationship. One of the standout scenes in Maggie O'Banion involves Paladin bringing food to the woman, who initially wants nothing to do with him. However, the dynamic changes when they engage in a conversation about literary greats, such as Percy Bysshe Shelley and William Shakespeare. Paladin, demonstrating his intellectual prowess, picks up a book and eloquently quotes from it. This exchange adds a layer of sophistication to the episode, showcasing Paladin's multifaceted character beyond the typical gunslinger archetype. Richard Boone, the versatile actor behind the iconic character Paladin in Have Gun, Will Travel, took a keen interest in the evolution of his character. In a 1959 interview with the New York Daily News, Boone shed light on the collaborative process that shaped Paladin's development over the course of the series. The original script was crafted by Herb Meadows and Sam Rolfe, 
but Boone's portrayal infused the character with unique dimensions that reflected his own contributions. Boone acknowledged that the character he played had undergone transformations since the inception of the series. He expressed a sense of ownership and pride in molding Paladin to align with his vision. Among the alterations, Boone emphasized his role in introducing a sense of humor to Paladin's persona, diminishing the character's preoccupation with money and deepening his overall outlook on life. Importantly, he successfully incorporated Tendersini's without compromising the Cora concept of Paladin as a courageous and adventurous figure. The actor's involvement went beyond merely bringing the scripted lines to life. On challenging scripts, Boone actively engaged with the creative process. He proposed changes and adjustments based on his deep understanding of the show and Paladin's character. Boone's intuitive grasp of how to enhance the narrative and the character's complexity allowed him to contribute significantly to the show's artistic development. While Boone contemplated writing at one point, he recognized that his true passion lay in acting. He candidly admitted that although he could discern whether a line was good or not, he lacked the patience required for the writing process. Acting, for him, was a source of immense joy and gratification. Despite not pursuing a career in writing, Boone's influence on Paladin's character underscored his creative input in shaping the show's trajectory. Boone's multifaceted engagement with the entertainment industry is evident in his foray into directing. He directed three episodes of Have Gun, Will Travel, a testament to his belief that directing, especially in terms of the camera, offered a more creative outlet than acting. Boone acknowledged the director's pivotal role in storytelling, asserting that the story must be told effectively or risk being lost. This inclination towards directing showcased Boone's broader artistic aspirations and further solidified his imprint on the series' creative landscape. In 1962, as Have Gun Will Travel neared its conclusion, Richard Boone already had his sights set on a groundbreaking project with NBC, an anthology series titled The Richard Boone Show. This venture, which showcased Boone's multifaceted talents, distinguished itself from other anthologies through a unique approach. Boone assembled a repertory company of 15 actors, and each member would take on different roles in various episodes, creating a dynamic and versatile ensemble. As both the star and producer of The Richard Boone Show, Boone demonstrated a commitment to pushing the boundaries of television storytelling. The anthology comprised 25 episodes, with Boone himself appearing in each one, sometimes in prominent roles and at other times in more minor capacities. This format allowed for a rich tapestry of characters and narratives, fostering an environment where actors could showcase their range and versatility. In an interview with the Brooklyn Daily Eagle in April 1963, Boone provided insights into the philosophy behind the anthology. He rejected the notion that it was a mere laboratory, emphasizing that it was more aptly described as a workshop. Unlike a laboratory where experiments with unknowns occur, Boone's workshop featured a repertory company stocked with known quantities in various facets of the dramatic arts. This included actors, writers, and directors creating a collaborative environment for honing their craft. Boone's vision for the workshop was rooted in the idea of collaboration and the pursuit of excellence. He explained that the primary challenge lay in coupling the right individuals in different arenas to achieve the best possible end result. This innovative approach aimed to break away from the formulaic nature of many television series. Boone rejected the idea of adhering strictly to a preconceived script, viewing it as a strangulation of creativity. Instead, he envisioned a process where the story would be meticulously worked over in the workshop, mirroring the way actors refine their characterizations in acting classes. Tragically, just a year after its debut, The Richard Boone Show faced a bleak fate. The anthology, despite its innovative approach and a talented ensemble, succumbed to the relentless ratings pressure imposed by CBS's sitcom Petticoat Junction 
and found itself on the receiving end of a cancellation notice from NBC. The abrupt end of the show marked a somber turn of events for Richard Boone and his accomplished company of performers. The Pasadena Independent, reflecting on the turn of events, expressed a sense of injustice in seeing Boone and his talented team go off the air at the conclusion of the current season. The repertory company, under Boone's leadership, had consistently delivered a series of interesting, provocative, and humorous hour-long shows each week on NBC. Despite Boone's star power being a significant draw and a major selling point to sponsors, he demonstrated his commitment to the ensemble by occasionally casting himself in minor roles, showcasing the collaborative and egalitarian spirit of the production. The cancellation hit Boone hard, as reported by the Pasadena Independent. The actor, known for his dedication and passion for his craft, did not take the news lightly. The demise of The Richard Boone Show marked the end of a creative experiment that aimed to redefine television storytelling and showcase the depth of talent within the repertory company. The bitter aftermath of The Richard Boone Show cancellation revealed a palpable sense of frustration and disappointment on Richard Boone's part. Adding insult to injury, the network's handling of the situation intensified his disdain for the industry's commercial control over creative endeavors. What particularly stung Boone was the manner in which he learned about the cancellation. The network failed to extend the courtesy of direct communication, leaving Boone to discover the fate of his show through the impersonal channels of the Hollywood trades. This lack of transparency and communication struck a nerve with the actor, prompting him to openly criticize NBC's handling of the situation. Boone minced no words in expressing his disapproval, declaring that the network's approach reflected their character. He accused NBC of choosing the most chicken-gutless way possible to deliver the news. The decision to leak the information to trade papers rather than communicate directly with Boone and his team underscored the perceived disconnect between the creative minds behind the shows and the business-oriented decisions made by network executives. In a broader commentary on the state of the television industry, Boone lamented the influence of advertising graduates in positions of power. He argued that as long as the business remained in their hands, creative individuals faced an uphill battle in realizing their visions. Boone's disillusionment with the industry was evident as he expressed concern for the next creative a mind that might face a similar challenges, highlighting the systemic issues that stifled creativity within the television landscape. Three years after the cancellation, Boone's sentiments had not waned. In an interview with the Los Angeles Times, he reiterated the difficulties of achieving one's best work in the television industry. He bemoaned the seemingly irreversible trend of commercial control overpowering the creative side of the business. This observation echoed his earlier critique of the industry's trajectory, emphasizing the weakening influence of creatives in the face of increasing commercial pressures. The cancellation of The Richard Boone Show marked a significant turning point in Richard Boone's relationship with the Hollywood system. The disappointment and frustration he experienced during and after the demise of the anthology series seemed to have a lasting impact on his perspective. Rather than continuing to navigate the challenges of the Hollywood industry, Boone opted for a change in scenery. Post-cancellation, Boone decided to relocate with his family to Hawaii, a decision that reflected both a physical and metaphorical departure from the industry's dynamics that had left a bitter taste. In Hawaii, Boone found solace and fell in love with the state, appreciating its natural beauty and distinct cultural atmosphere. His connection to Hawaii went beyond personal enjoyment. Boone played a pivotal role in bringing the television series Hawaii 5-0 to the islands. Instrumental in convincing producer Leonard Freeman to shoot the series in Hawaii, Boone's influence contributed to the iconic show's unique setting and atmosphere. The decision to film on location added authenticity to the series, showcasing the beauty and allure of Hawaii to a global audience. Interestingly, 
Boone was not merely a behind-the-scenes advocate for the series. He was offered the lead role of Steve McGarrett. However, perhaps as a reflection of his disenchantment with the Hollywood system, he chose to decline the opportunity. The role ultimately went to Jack Lord, who became synonymous with the character and left an indelible mark on the legacy of Hawaii Five Zero. Richard Boone's journey came to an end on January 10, 1981, at his home in St. Augustine, Florida. The cause of his death was complications arising from throat cancer, marking the culmination of a life rich in accomplishments, challenges, and contributions to the world of entertainment. Boone's legacy extended beyond his acting prowess. He became a cultural ambassador for Florida in the later years of his life, contributing significantly to the artistic and theatrical landscape of the state. Despite the challenges he faced, including a car accident in 1963, Boone remained resilient and continued to immerse himself in the world of acting theater and cultural advocacy. Following his passing, Boone's final resting place mirrored the diverse and impactful chapters of his life. His ashes were scattered in the Pacific Ocean off Hawaii a poignant tribute to the place he had come to love during his time there. This symbolic connection to the Pacific Ocean served as a fitting farewell for a man whose career had spanned from the mainland to the scenic islands, leaving an indelible mark on the cultural and artistic tapestry of both. What do you think about the tragedies that happened in Richard Boone's life? Leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.